Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You know, Valentine's Day traditionally is a day that has been set aside secularly where married couples uh, try to take a time or moment to focus on their marriages and focus on the relationship. And, you know, for a lot of married couples, if they can, they try to set it apart as a date time for each other. And, of course, with COVID right now, I'm not sure if you really want to go out to eat in a restaurant, but if you do, God bless you for that. But maybe some of you might want to do a takeout or whatever it might be like that. And then for those who are very, who are courting and very serious about one another, they're also thinking about, you know, spending time with each other and, and just, you know, cherishing the moments and things of that nature. That's a good thing. I, I'm, I'm glad for Valentine's Day in that respect, uh, you know, but I think for everyone who's married and everyone who's seriously in love, I, I think that every day should be a Valentine's Day, amen? Every day should be a day that you look forward to being with, with your spouse. I mean, marriage is this relationship where, you, where you, you can't imagine being without that person you're married to. And marriage is a relationship that you look forward to going home to a loving spouse. And marriage should be a place where when you leave home, you, there's a party that says, I don't want to leave home. I want to be with my spouse. And so there's a lot of good things we can say about marriage. But let me say this this morning. There are no perfect marriages, and every marriage has struggles, and every marriage has difficulty. As we'll see in this passage of Scripture, we have a God who's the God of marriage, amen? And we have a God who cares about marriage, and we have a God who tells us how to deal with our marriage. And we're going to see something here this morning that is a wonderful, wonderful passage of Scripture that deals with the very first miracle that our Lord Jesus Christ is. So knowing that this morning, and knowing that God loves us, and knowing that's an everlasting love that He has for us, I want us to look at this passage of Scripture and notice the application of marriage. Now, there's a many applications we see here, but I wanted to see a primary application of marriage. And I believe this this morning. I believe that the Bible is God's playbook on marriage. I don't think you can improve upon what the Bible says on marriage. No matter what books you, write, you read out there, no matter who the author was, they may have a good illustration, they may have a twist on something, they may have a, a thought on something that might, might appeal to you, but I'll tell you this morning that nothing out, out in the secular world will improve upon what the Bible says about marriage. Every single person who desires to get married, should be listening today and taking very good notes so they're thinking about how can I prepare myself to be a good spouse. And everyone who's recently married, who's just trying to improve in their marriage, ought to be thinking about that. And all of us who've been around who might be, you might say, uh, uh, we might be veterans of being married, we ought to look at this passage of Scripture and just be very encouraged that God cares about our relationships and where we spend our time and what we do. And so this morning as we look at John chapter 2 verses 1 to 11, here are the key thoughts and takeaways I want you to think about. Number one, I want you to notice the importance of having Jesus in your marriage. The importance of having Jesus in your marriage. Number two, I want you to notice the importance of having Jesus in your plans. Okay? It's not just marriage, but you'll notice here, it's important to have Jesus in your plans. Not only that, thirdly, I want us to notice the importance of having Jesus in your life. Amen? Jesus in your marriage, Jesus in your plans, Jesus in your life. Now notice some things. I hope you'll take some notes this morning because this is, this is going to be kind of fun and things. I'm not going to throw some, some humor into this as I normally would because I, I don't have enough time. But I want you to notice some things that are very enlightening and encouraging. Number one, I want you to see with me the celebration of marriage. Now notice this passage. This passage of Scripture takes us to an actual marriage ceremony. Now when we do a marriage here, and we've done, I've had the privilege of doing quite a few they're wonderful events. They're wonderful occasions. I mean, when you think about a marriage, you think about the, when you come to that marriage ceremony, you think about the attire of the bride and the attire of the, of the groom. And, you know, and I tell the guys this when we do marriage counseling. I tell the guys this. I said, now, guys, I said, you know, your, your part in this is very easy. You just go out to men's warehouse and you get yourself a tuxedo and rent a pair of shoes, get some socks that don't have holes in it, amen, you know, and get, get some good, you know, get some good clothes. It's easy for the guys. But for the women, it's a major production, amen. For the women, it's a major planning event. And you can't under, underestimate that or undermine that. I mean, she's got to go to the wedding. She's got to go to the wedding boutique shop, and she's got to examine the, the dresses. And it doesn't help that the pastor says, "Now I know you're going to try to find a beautiful dress, and the wedding dresses are beautiful. They're in white, and they've got all these decorations on it. But we ask you to dress in modesty because the, the dresses of today kind of are a little bit more revealing than we like them to be. So we encourage the the the, uh, the, the young young brides to be make sure you get something that covers your shoulders and, and covers up to your neck there. I mean, you don't we don't want you looking Victorian in person. But we want you to be modest, amen. You know, and so we want you to because it's a Christian wedding, and you're 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 testifying of Jesus Christ here. But you know, I've never done a marriage, and I've never been to marriage where there was a bride that was not beautiful. I mean, the bride just comes down there. I mean, she spent she has spent all morning getting all made up, and she hires somebody to help get her made up. She gets all made up, gets her hair done, and she's just she's just ready. And you know, she has to wake up like at four o'clock in the morning. She probably needs to get sleep the night before, and she gets herself ready, and she gets all decked out, and he gets all decked out, and that's wonderful. We look at that, but. But then we come to the ceremony, 
And we're looking at things like the floor arrangement and who did the flowers. And, and if the cake is there, we look at the table over there and we say, oh yeah, look at this cake and we see how beautiful the cake is. And, and we look at that and we're looking at all the decor around there. And we look at the aisle in terms of the, the runner that's down there and the flowers along the way. And we look at the cute little flower girl and the cute little you know, boy that's going to carry the Bible and, and all of these things. And we look at the, we look at the groomsmen and, groom, and bridesmaids and we look at the parents who are just beaming with, 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 with joy and happiness and they're dressed out very nice and there's just beautifulness there and then we're thinking about the food and there's a lavish feast that's there and in many many circles they have a banquet that follows a reception that follows I mean we look at that and weddings are big business I mean they're really really big business and and there's the photography aspect and you know one of the first things I asked a prospective married couple I said okay now you're planning this have you thought about how much you're going to have to budget have you have you started working in budget have you thought about what you're going to have to budget for this and they think so and we kind of talk about that and how to make sure they don't go over budget and things of that nature and uh, all that there but when you think about a wedding it's a it's a time of celebration. We don't come there to mourn, amen? We don't come there to be sad. We come there to be to rejoice and be happy. And Jesus, you'll notice here, the Bible says in John chapter 2, verse 1, the third day there was a marriage in Cain of Galilee. Now, two things I want you to see as I get into this. You notice that it's talking about the third day. The third day being after Jesus had been ministering on the, on the seashore of the Lake of Galilee. And it was there he was calling his disciples to himself. Andrew came to him. And then Andrew brought Peter to him. And Peter called on the Lord to save him. And then Jesus the next day went after Philip. And he brought Philip to him. And then Philip got a burden on his heart for a friend named Nathaniel. And he brought Nathaniel. And Jesus is building this, these followers, these disciples, who would become the nucleus of the New Testament church a, a, a few chapters later. But along the way, that Jesus and his family was invited to this marriage. Now, marriages in those days was a big event for the cities and the towns. They were there. Cana was one of the many cities that was part of the Galilean district or the Galilean province there. And so it was a very important place. Everybody knew everybody. In fact, it wouldn't be a surprise if everybody in Cana of Galilee attended this wedding. It was a big thing. People from outside of there. I mean, Mary was from Nazareth and Jesus from Nazareth. But people in Nazareth and Cana knew each other and they'd be invited. You guys know what I'm talking about there. If you come from a foreign country and you're your foreign country, your town, your village, probably the whole village, the whole town would come. And it would be a big event, a big thing. I remember I was on a, a mission trip way up north in China. And we were in the middle of nowhere. I had no idea where we were at. And I told, the, I told the guy driving our car, I said, now if this thing breaks down and we get lost here, no one will ever know where I'm at because I'm in the middle of nowhere. I have nowhere where I'm at. And we stopped us at this village somewhere, I mean just in the middle of nowhere, and just this village popped up. And as we pulled in to have lunch, we, we, there was this big wedding ceremony in this restaurant. I mean, it, this was a country wedding, but they were decked out. I mean, they were really, really decked out. It was a lavish wedding. And, we, you know, we came in, and we're kind of scruffy looking because we, we've been traveling all day and, and things like that. And we walked and we felt kind of out of place there, but they said, no, we got a place for you. You can go in this private room and have your, have your lunch over here well, and not bother the wedding couple. But I kind of peeked outside and looked at it. It was a lavish event. I mean, there were hundreds of people there, and it looked like in that little village that everybody in that little village had come, and they took, and you know, you know how the Bible talks about the fatted calf? Well, in that village, they had the fatted pig, amen? I mean, it was a big pig that they killed. They roasted the pig, and, and they had it all set up there and ready, and it was a lavish event. And, and marriages are a lavish event. They were wonderful times of celebration. But I want you to understand something. Marriages are a great celebration, not because a marriage is a man thought, it is a God thought. It is a God idea. God is the originator of marriage. We must never forget that marriage is not something that conveniently came up because somebody thought it was a good idea. It's a God idea. God is the one who originated marriage. And as we think about the concept and the celebration, notice what Jesus Christ himself had to say about this. He said in Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6, And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Now you know what he's saying there? Jesus said that God created marriage as a joyful union of a man and woman. He made marriage, first of all, to cure the problem of companionship. Because before all that, Jesus said this, it is not good for man that he should be alone. Now God recognized that deep down in our earnest hearts, we are people that want to have a friendships and we're people that will have companionship. But a deep longing companionship is to be someone that you share your life with, that you spend your time with. And so the Lord made marriage as a method of companionship. He made Adam first and then he made Eve out of Adam and he brought them together. She was very similar to him but she was different from him. And God took something out of Adam and made it something wonderful and brought her to him and they too became one flesh. God made marriage for companionship. But God made marriage for commitment. God intended 
that this relationship would be together. In fact, with this commitment, there is a marriage covenant. And the marriage covenant are the vows that the husband and wife exchange each other. Now, Vows are important, and I know most married couples that I marry, they know they're going to be very nervous standing in front of each other. They're very nervous about what they're going to say. So in many cases, they say, Pastor, would you mind if you just give us the vows and we repeat after you? I said, as long as you mean it from your heart, I will do that. Amen? And so we will do something like that. But I appreciate couples who really get a burden, and they, get, they just get a muster up enough courage where they write out their own vows, and they let me study it over to make sure they have all the right things in it. And they write up their own vows to exchange them. There's just something meaningful to that. But in this covenant, the covenant of marriage was designed that marriages would stay together. Notice in Matthew 19, 6, Jesus said, what therefore God has joined together. Marriage is when God brings us together. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. The word asunder has many meanings. In one extreme, the word asunder can mean a falling away. We get our word apostasy from that. But another extreme, the word asunder can also mean or be connotated the word divorce. And God said, you know, my goal for marriage is that it's to be permanent. And as much as possible, I don't want a divorce to happen. Now, Jesus recognized that, and he addressed the matter of divorce in Matthew chapter 19. I preached about that last year on a Wednesday night. If you're interested in what the Bible says about that, because I'm not going to get into it today, you can go back into the sermon archives in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I preached about two or three messages about that from 1 Corinthians 7. You can look it up there. But God's design, he wants marriage to be permanent. He wants it to stay together. And so there's this consolidation. And notice in consolidation, what happens here is that two become one. The husband and wife become one. He says, they are no more two. So in other words, you have a woman who has her home life, you have a man who's got his home life, but when they get married, they become one. Two become one. They become one in thought, they become one in direction, they become one in heart, they become one physically, they become one spiritually, they become one emotionally. I mean, they're two become one. And that's a wonderful thing. The concept of marriage, why should we celebrate it? Because the Bible says this, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. God blesses marriage. The Bible says to husband, whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing or a good cause. The literal Hebrew word means a good cause. And so we look at marriage and everything the Bible says, it is a time of celebration because of the concept. But notice verses two and three. It is a time of celebration, not only because of the concept, because of those who are called. Now, weddings are wonderful because of the bride and the groom, and they're the centerpiece of the, of the celebration. But weddings are wonderful because there are guests at the wedding. You know, it's an honor to be invited to a wedding, amen? It's an honor that someone considers you close enough or near enough that they would invite you to the wedding. They want you to be in attendance to observe and to witness the exchanging of their vows and two becoming one. I mean, for parents especially, it's a wonderful thing. When their children come together to be able to extend an invitation to relatives and friends, they can come. They may not know your son and they may not know your daughter or future daughter-in-law, but they, they come to be, give observance to that and to give respect to that and to honor it. And it's a wonderful thing to have guests. And every guest that comes to the wedding is a guest of honor. Notice if you would in verse 2 and three. In verses 1 and 2, G, the notice there, Mary was called to the wedding. Uh, there were the, the people that lived in Cain of Galilee that were called to the wedding. People in the surrounding villages were called to the wedding. Jesus' disciples were called to the wedding. But you know the most important person was called to the wedding? It was Jesus himself. The Bible says Jesus was called to the wedding. Jesus was invited there. Can I tell you this this morning? If you're going to get married, if you're going to have a marriage, at the center of your marriage should be Jesus Christ. You want to start your marriage off right? You need to start off with Jesus Christ at the center. You need to start off realizing it's not the minister of peace, it's not the ordained pastor, it's not the justice of peace. The most important person in the wedding must be Jesus Christ himself. Look what it says there. Jesus was called. Jesus is at the center of a marriage, there's purpose. When Jesus is at the center of a marriage, there's priority. When Jesus is at the center of a marriage, there's protection. When Jesus is at the center of our marriages, there's possibility. When Jesus is at the center of our marriage, there's power. And I think of prayer power because the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 3, 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel as being heirs together the grace of life. Notice that your prayers be not hindered. Boy, every time husband and wife prays, they're 
preparing themselves and fine-tuning themselves because the day will come when there will be struggles and trials and difficulties and you want your prayer time with your spouse set aside so that you're living for God. That's why as we started off these prayer groups this year, we try to emphasize let your Monday nights be a time for individual prayer and family prayer and not that you're not praying other times, but make sure you set aside that time at least conscientiously to have that time. Oh, listen, marriage is a wonderful celebration time, but it's a wonderful celebration when we recognize the concept is of God and we recognize the most important person that needs to be in our marriage from the outset needs to be Jesus Christ himself. Notice the second thing, though. Do you notice verse 3? We see a celebration in marriage, but do you notice the stress in marriage? The Bible says, And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto them, They have no wine. Would you underline those last two words, no wine? Jewish marriage ceremonies would last for a week, seven days, sometimes longer. And as they're planning this event, this is why they have a one-year betrothal before they get married. They have, all the, they have the legalities of marriage, but they're not coming together because the groom was expected the one year before they got married to get everything prepared and ready to have a house for his wife, but to get ready for the big ceremony. And just like maybe in the foreign country that you may have uh, immigrated from, in those days it would be a disaster and it would be a disgrace and it would be a very stressful moment if you had a wedding that ran out of food, and ran out of beverage. It'd be a wa- terrible thing. And so you plan out, you're going to have a seven-day ceremony, you'd plan out enough food, and you'd plan enough beverage to make sure that you have more than enough. It's always better to plan more than enough there. But this marriage, so many, for whatever, whatever happened, this groom and this bride, or whoever planned the wedding, fell short of wine. And the Bible says on that third day, Mary, recognizing that she happened to be around the servants, and Mary may have been related to these people or close friends to them, she happened to be there. And just as Jesus is walking through the threshold of that home, just as he comes through with the disciples, Mary comes to him, and she says, Jesus, or she says, son, she says, they have no wine. No, she's saying, you know, Jesus, we got a problem here, and I'm glad you're here. You're here just at the right time. By the way, aren't you glad Jesus is there for you right at the right time? And he came, and she walked in, and not, it wasn't that Jesus didn't know that. But Mary came, and she said, son, she says, Jesus, we, they have no one. Do you know why we have stress in our lives? And do you know why we have stress in our marriages? And do you know why we have stress in what goes on? It tells us right there, they have no wine. Typically, stress happens because of something we don't have or something that is missing. No time. No money. No joy. No happiness, no peace, no possessions. The home's not big enough or the home's too big. No money, too much debt. It's either comes because stress comes because of something we don't have or something that we're missing. We have no plans. There's a lack of trust. There's no direction. Hey, worse than all those things, worse than lacking plans and worse than lacking direction and worse than lacking happiness and worse than lacking joy, you know the worst thing to be missing is to missing Jesus Christ in your home and your life. And she came, and you can see on her face because she empathized with the need there. There was great stress. And listen, the stress would amplify itself many, many more times if the bride and groom and the parents and everybody else and the ruler of the feast found out about it. The only people that knew at that moment in time were the servants and Mary. They said they were told to go get some more wine. We've run short of wine. Somebody go get it. And they just assumed it was there. And they came looking. They looked, in the, they, looked in the, they looked in the pantries. They looked in the storage houses. They looked everywhere. There was no wine anywhere to be found. What a stressful moment moment. Stress, when it comes in our life, it weighs us down. It's a heavy burden. At that moment in time, we're going in desperation mode, and it's something we didn't plan for, and it becomes an immense pressure. And I want you to know, had this couple, had this got out to the rest of the marriage, to everybody that was invited to the marriage, this would have been a complete disgrace. In fact, they say, some Jewish commentators say this, they say that if a marriage ceremony got to the place where, they're, where, they, where they, it's discovered they ran short of food and wine, they would be made, made fun of, they would become the laughing stock, and they would always be remembered as the family that failed to have enough food or have enough beverage. That would be a terrible thing. They would always be remembered. They would be the laughing stock of the village. They would be, if you would, they would be the poster child for everyone to say, don't you ever have a wedding like them. That would be a very terrible thing. 
And because Mary recognized that she's close to these people and she didn't want them to be under this stress and she didn't want them to be under this pressure. Notice she's thinking now, I've got to go to Jesus and tell Jesus about it. So what do you do when you have stress in your life? And what do you do when you have stress in your marriage? And what do you, what do, you do when you have stress in your job? And what do you do when you have stress in, your, in, in, in school? And maybe you're stressed out because your children are not back in school. And maybe you're stressed out because you're not sure what's going to happen with your job. And maybe you're stressed out because you've got a physical ailment or malady. Maybe you're stressed out about something going on in your life. You've got great stress that you know you're thankful that you came into the weekend and you had Saturday to be with your family and Sunday to be in the Lord's house and Sunday to worship God. But you know that tomorrow morning when you get up at the crack of dawn, as you go to work, that you're going to face something very stressful. What do you do when you're under stress? Well, we see the celebration. We see the stress. But you notice the next thing. We see the submission. Notice what happens in verse 3 and 4. Jesus said to her woman, and he wasn't being impolite or disrespectful. He was, that's how they dress uh, a woman of dignity in those days, he would call her woman. It was a very dignified term. He said, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. In other words, he's saying, he's telling her, Mary? It's like, do you really think this is something I can't do? And Mary knew when she got that response that Jesus was there at the right time, the right moment. And I want to tell you this morning, whatever stress you're under, God knows. God knows before it even happened. Not only does God know, God is there at the right time, the right moment, but there's a requirement on our part. The requirement on our part is the requirement of submission. Mary turns to the servants, and she says to the servants, would you notice this? Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Now, let's talk about submission for just a moment, because I'm talking about this matter of submission leading into the miracle. What do we mean by submission? Because submission can have a bad connotation. I've heard preachers and pastors and, and sometimes men jokingly say, well, submission means wives, submit yourselves unto your, unto your, unto your husband. And they're talking about this being like, like, you know, this is where she needs to be the slave. That's not what the Bible's teaching there. There's a principle behind biblical submission. And if you'll take a moment, would you turn with me to the book of Ephesians, look at chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 to 33, actually deals with principles of marriage. But I want you to notice the underlying, the, the major theme there is the matter of submission, and it begins with verse 21. Would you notice that? Ephesians 5, 21. Now, what I'm going to tell you in verse 21 carries over to every aspect of life. It helps us in every aspect of, of, of stress here. In Ephesians 5, 21... Paul is speaking about the life that is controlled by the Spirit of God. That's the context here. A life that is controlled by the Spirit of God because he talks about the fruit of the Spirit in previous verses and three verses before that, he talks about being filled with the Spirit. So he's talking about the context of a life walking in the Spirit. So remember that. We get to verse 21 and the Lord, Paul is not speaking just to husbands or wives. He's talking to everybody. And he says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, what is the principle in submission? Submission is a military word. Submission is the Greek word hupatasso. The word hupa, if you get into word studies, the word hupa, anytime you find it in the Bible, always is used in the reference of coming under something. So in other words, the word hupatasso is a military term, and it speaks of rank and order, okay? Now, when he, we talk about rank and order, that does not mean that, uh, let me use an example of that. An example would be, in a military sense, a private to a sergeant. The private is under rank to the sergeant, or a sergeant to a lieutenant, or a lieutenant to a captain, or a captain to a, to, a, to a major, and a major to a colonel, and a colonel to a, fa- a one-star general, and a one-star general to a five-star general, and a five-star general to a, to, if you would, to the president of the United States. I mean, there's this rank and order. Now watch this. It doesn't mean that one is superior to the other. It just means we've established in our social order, or in our, if, I, if you would, into a military rank, that we have to report to other people. An example being at work. You might be more talented, and you might be more competent, than your supervisor, but you recognize that because that's your supervisor, that's your boss, or that's the owner, that you are under rank to them. You report to them. That's what the Bible's saying there. Now, what the Bible's telling us as, as, as believers, that we must submit ourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. In other words, we have respect towards one another. We have reverence towards one another. Let me just say this this morning. We live in a culture today which practices cancel culture, a, a culture that says you can show disrespect and it doesn't matter, and you can be disrespectful. And I want to remind you, as 
as God's people, as being Christians, let us be careful that we are training our children to have respect, to have deference, to have reverence, and to teach them along the way to have respect to those in position of authority. Other people might do that. Members of Congress might do that. And where you have a member of Congress, Speaker of the House might get up, and after a State of the Union address might tear the speech in half. But I want to tell you, that is not what we're advocating to our children, and that is not what we're advocating as Christians. We must remind ourselves, as difficult as it may be, we must show this matter of reverence and, and respect towards one another, no matter what it may be. And so, as God gives us this principle of submission, he's not telling us it means that you're less in nature or you're inferior. He's just saying, be respectful in the nature of relationships, for relationships to have harmony, and relationships to, have, to work out problems, and for relationships to work through stress. We must understand that we must have the submission. Now, a lot of times, uh, teenagers and parents run into difficulties. They butt heads with one another. And the, and the teenager who is very sharp and they're just at the cutting edge of learning, they feel like they know more than their parents until they get to about 35 and 40 and have children and realize they know less than their parents and just wait till the day comes, teenager. Your day will come, amen? But, but, you know, you, you, but at that moment in time, as a teenager, you feel like you know more than your mom, you more than your dad, and your mom and dad start popping gray hairs there because, they, because you're just kind of butting heads about things like that. And I just remind you today that, you know, as we, as we work through our families, our family stress, we must remember this principle of submission that we must understand our rank and our order, how we to submit ourselves so that there's orderliness in what we do there. And so this principle is giving there. But notice something else. Not only do we see the principle of submission, notice in verse 3, we see through Mary's example the prayer and submission. Now I'm going to tell you something that's so startling. Did you know your nature and my nature, our human nature is we don't want to submit? Did you know that? We want to be independent. We don't want to be told we're wrong. We always want to know that we're right. It's not our nature to submit. It's our, not our nature to come in the rain. That's why the military have what they call boot camp when you go in the military, amen? Boot camp is when that first, that first three months, they basically break down the will of the enlisting, the enlisting uh, military person to help them understand that you are in rank and you need to report. And you learn how to say yes, sir, yes, ma'am, all these kind of things there. They teach them rank and order. They break them down so they understand this is, this is how things run in the military. Otherwise, we're going to have chaos out on the battlefield. And you'll notice this here, that we, we have this situation where there's submission, but notice as we get to this place, we realize my human nature does not want to submit, and my human nature wants to resist, and my human nature wants to push back. How do you deal with that? Well, there must be prayer. Notice what Mary does. She goes to Jesus, and by the way, when we have problems and stress, we need to go to Jesus, Amen. What do you do with your stress? Well, the Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, be careful for nothing. Don't be stressed out. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. God is telling us when we have stress and we have anxiety and worry to take it to the Lord in prayer. And Mary does this. She pictures for us a Christian who's stressed out, taking her need to the Lord. We must come to the Lord in prayer. The Bible says this. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Hey, listen to the song we sing so, so frequently, but we forget about. What a friend we have in Jesus. Listen to this. All our sins and griefs to bear. And it's not segregating sins and griefs. They're together. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Now, if you're going through stress in your home, and you're going through stress in a relationship, and you're going through stress at work, and you're going through stress financially, and you're going through stress at work, and many people are, may I encourage you this morning to take it to the Lord in prayer, to give it to the Lord, to submit your, your needs to him. We've been studying the word commit in our, in our studies on Sunday nights, and we've talked about the fact the word commit literally means to roll something away, to roll the burden that you have on your life and on your heart and roll it unto the Lord. Give it to the Lord. Submit it to God. Well, we see the principle of submission. We see the prayer of submission. But notice quickly in verses 5 to 8, the practice of submission. Jesus is called to the marriage feast. The problem is given to him right as he gets there, and he's not, and Jesus gladly accepts it. How do we practice submission? How do we practice submission that will deal with our stress? Well, I think the first thing we see, notice it's found in verse 5, we see the matter of obedience. We must obey God. Look what Mary says to the servants. Whatsoever he saith unto you, what's the next two words? Do it. Nike stole that from the Bible, amen? Do it. You know the two most important words you say in a marriage ceremony as a husband and wife for exchanging vows? I do. If they say I don't, we got a problem, Amen? 
We can't go forward if they say I don't. If, I, if I'm marrying Aaron and Vivian, let's say today, and, they, and I, they were one of the first couples I married, you don't want Aaron saying, well, I don't. Or you don't want Vivian saying, I don't. No, we say in a situation, that I do. What's that saying? There's a willingness. There must be obedience. You know, he's, she said to those servants, whatever Jesus tells you to do, and I'm going to tell you this morning, one of the great simple secrets of the Christian life is just obeying God. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. We must obey God. But there's a second practice. We must have a servant's heart. Now, notice she goes to the servants, and the servants do not bicker, and the servants are not having problems. In fact, if anything, the servants are probably more concerned about this situation than probably anybody else in the marriage would be because they realize that their job is on the line. If this thing turns out to be a disaster, they could be out of a job, and they could be blamed for the situation. I mean, they don't want to be blamed for a lack of food and a lack of beverage and things of that nature. And notice they have a servant's heart. She said, whatsoever he say, then do you do it? And everything we find in verses 6, 7, and 8, they do exactly what they're told. You know what a servant's heart is? A servant's heart is basically saying, whatever I'm told to do, I'm going to do it. You know what a servant's heart is? It means that no matter what time of the day, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, in, the, in that context, I'm available. You know, I fear, I told this in the first hour, I fear many, many times that because we're, we're in such a professional world and we're so time-driven and schedule-driven, you know, and we compartmentalize our lives and we segmentize our days and we say things like this, well, you know, Sunday's the Lord's Day and so, you know, whatever we need to do, we're going to give it to the Lord and we dress our best and we come to church and we honor God and then, and then we, you know, we have our prayer group time during the week, and we come back on Wednesday nights for Bible study and maybe discipleship time, but the rest of the week that's not already compartmentalized where we have church-related things, we are so busy with our job and so busy with our things going on, we, we feel like we're walking on eggshells when we call somebody up and we'll ask them something like this. Now, you know, now I'll say, well, do you have the time to help us out? And there was a time and day, you know, even back at that time, where, where somebody, a servant, a servant's heart said, I'm available, whatever you need, I'm, I'm here, you can count me in, don't worry about walking on eggshells, I'm here to have it. And I just want to tell you this morning, I'm not telling you to be 24-7 what you do, because we're busy people, and we have many responsibilities. I mean, you have your marriage, you have your kids, you have your job, you have a lot of things, you got to take care of your parents, things like that. But I am telling you this, let's not lose the servant's heart about serving God, amen? Let's make sure that we are available no matter what, and there may be those occasions where maybe Maybe we have to sacrifice a moment. But, you know, there's no sacrifice we can make that's too great for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And we ought to just make ourselves available to the Lord and realize we're not compartmenting our lives that the only time we come to church is just on Sunday morning, but we're available at all times to serve the Lord and to honor God. And the practice here is notice, if you would, is we must obey God. We must have a servant. And by the way, one of the best strategies to have if we're going to have a home life that's peaceful, a home life that, that's workable, a home life that has the God's blessing upon it, we must must have that servant's heart towards our spouses. Wives to their husbands, husbands to our wives. We have to realize it's about us serving one another because the greatest joy we can bring to each other is serving one another. But there's another thought. We must obey God in our practice, and we must have a servant's heart in our practice. But notice verses 6 to 8, something that is so oblivious to all of us. Oblivious means we don't even see. When the Jews entered into a home, especially for a marriage ceremony, they put aside water pots like these, six major clay water pots, porcelain water pots. And the Bible says there were, there were six water pots set aside for the manner of the purifying the Jews. Now, people who walked those days wore open-toed shoes. They were sandals. And their feet would get dirty. And the, and the streets were dirty and dusty. And so, and it'd be sweaty and it'd be humid. And so, wonderful, wonderful things that happened. If you came to somebody's house, a good host would have these water pots ready with servants ready there to wash your feet. And so, these, fir, these, these water pots that contain two to three firkins, they, these firkins means that they basically had anywhere from, anywhere from 18 or 16, 18 to 24, maybe 27 gallons of water. If you filled up to the brim, there'd be more than enough water to, to wash your feet. But remember now, those water pots were there at the beginning, and many of the guests were already there, and their feet had been washed, and now Jesus comes and his disciples, and their feet have been washed. And so these water pots are kind of there, and nobody's really paying attention to these water pots. They're just empty, available vessels there. That's what the Bible calls them. It says they were empty water pots. They were vessels that were there. And so they were there, and everybody was oblivious to that because as Jesus' disciples are standing there. They're hearing this report from Mary. Hey, Jesus, there's a problem here. They are out of wine. What are you going to do about it? You know, and Jesus, Jesus is kind of watching them because they've been told to obey him, and they've been told to just to watch what he says and do whatever he says to do and to have a servant's heart. And notice Jesus pays attention to the things that we often neglect. He looks at these empty water pots. You know, I tell you something this morning. 
If we come into a marriage relationship with our own agenda, I'm right, you're wrong, and we come into a marriage relationship trying to establish that I'm in control, not you, instead of being like an empty water pot, where we're empty and available for God to use us, we're not going to make it. Because this is what the Bible says. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ. And, and he says, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Let the foundation of the Lord stand sure. And he says, uh, and he says the Lord knoweth them that are his. And, and he says this, let, that, that him that nameth the name of Christ do no evil, do no sin, do no iniquity. And he says, for in a great house there are also vessels of gold and vessels of silver and of wood and of earth, and some of honor, some to dishonor. And if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified in meat for the master's use, and prepared unto give every good work. Let me tell you this morning, as we think about the practice of submission, the Lord is looking for husbands and wives and young people, that in our home life there were vessels set aside and prepared and available for God to use us. Listen, having our vessels clean for the Lord to use us is not just for the service of the Lord, and it's just not individual. We must set ourselves aside for the usage of God in our home life, in our, in our, in our marriages, in our family, and in serving our parents. And then Jesus was paying attention to vessels that needed to be dealt with. Listen, God works through clean, empty, and available vessels. That's why they're called vessels under honor. He looked at these vessels and he was casting a bigger picture. He said, look at these vessels. These vessels are to be vessels under honor. God wants to work through our life. And many times, you know what goes on? Our vessels are filled up. They're filled with anger. They're filled with jealousy. They're filled with unforgiveness. They sometimes get filled with bitterness. They sometimes get filled with unforgiveness. They get filled up with other things. They get filled up with materialism. You know what the Lord wants us to do and recognize as we work this matter of submission? Our vessels need to be clean. And our vessels need to be empty. And our vessels need to be available. Amen? I mean, that's what God wants in our life there. And so we see this matter of submission. And so Jesus now, he's done that. He's, he, he's, there's this emphasis on obedience. There's this emphasis on our servant's heart. There's this emphasis on a vessels under honor. But notice something else. Now he turns to the servants. And he says, draw out now and bear to the governor of the feast. Now, they did what he told them to do. They just poured, they filled it to the brim with water. And you have to imagine the servants are pouring this up with water, and they're thinking, okay, now, it was like this. What's he going to do? And he says, now I want you to take it out. And they get a ladle or a cup or whatever device they use, and they draw the water out of the vessel. And he says, I want you to draw the water out now, and he bear it to the governor of the feast, and they bear it, and the ruler of the feast had tasted. Can I tell you this this morning? People know. They can tell. People know and can tell when there's submission. They know if we're fighting. They know if there's hostility. They know if there's struggles there. They know if there's stress there. And they drew it out. They wanted this man to taste it. And I'm just saying this morning, God wants us to understand the practical importance of, of, of submission. But there's something else here. We see the celebration. We see the stress. i got to hurry now. Notice we see submission. We're almost at the end. Would you notice what Jesus does in this? Would you notice, number four, the serum? The serum means the antidote. In our, in our news this week and last week and maybe for the rest of the year, the big headlines is, is COVID-19 vaccines. Amen? It's about vaccines. And all the excitement is if we get everybody vaccinated, and it doesn't matter what, 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 what pharmaceutical company, if we get everybody vaccinated, hopefully we've given them enough immunity that there's enough efficacy through the, through the vaccine that you won't get the, the virus or at least you'll be immune for it for a period of time until you have to get vaccinated again. And the big idea is there is that there's a serum that's available. And you notice this morning, I want to see something. As we look at this passage of Scripture, the importance of this matter was leading up to turning the situation that was a disaster into something that would be a blessing. And do you notice this here? As we get to this passage, we look at verse 9 again. And the governor of the feast, the ruler of the feast, tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was. Now watch what happens. Water was in those containers. Tasteless, ordinary water. Water is tasteless. We get used to water. We drink water. We try to stay hydrated. We know the importance of water. But it was water that went within. But when the man 
taste of the what tasted of it, it wasn't water that he tasted. Along the way, there was a transformation. The properties of the water were changed into properties of the grape juice or wine. It was transformed. It was changed. It went from being tasteless to being sweet. It went from being ordinary to being extraordinary. It went from something that nobody got excited about. It came to something where, hmm, this tastes really good. It was sweet and it was tantalizing. It was refreshing. He changed it. And listen, the person that changed it was the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, as that water was being poured into those containers, transformed that water into wine. He changed the very property. I mean, all the process you would go through of picking the grapes, putting it into a vat, stepping on it, smashing it, and then letting it pour out, and then draining it and getting it and stirring it up for a little bit so that it would age a little bit there and have a sweetness to it and tantalizingness. Listen, everything about it represented freshly squeezed grape juice. And when the man tasted it, he didn't know that this transformation had taken place, but he knew something had happened to it. He said, listen, this is wonderful. He said, most men keep the good wine, present the good wine at the beginning, and then they give that which is worse at the end. But he said, you've kept the good wine until now. Now notice what happens. Jesus changed this into this. What did he do? He changed from within to produce something that would come without the serum for our marriages, and the serum for our life is when we give control to the Lord, we give something that is ordinary and something that feels like it, it, just, it's, it's not, it, it just it won't make a difference. And we give it to the Lord, and as the Lord changes it, he changes the nature of it into something better and something that's sweet and something that's what, hey, listen, when Jesus changes from within, and that's what he does. The change must be from within. When Jesus changes from within, you know what he does? He turns bitterness into sweetness. He turns unforgiveness into forgiveness. He turns ugliness into beauty. He turns unforgiveness to forgiveness. He turns anger into peacefulness. He turns hurtful words into good words. He takes cursing and turns it into blessing. You know what Jesus does? He changes us from within. Because, you know, a lot of us, we have something that's inside us that's like this that needs to be turned into this. He makes that which is bitter sweet. He wants to change it from within. And by the way, the biggest change that can happen in your life, and when Jesus takes an unsaved person, a person that's lost and going to hell, he changes you and turns you into a saved person person that's going to heaven. That's what he wants to do. Change must come from within. But you and I don't have the power to change us. We must have the power of Jesus Christ to change us. But how does it happen? It happens because there's submission. It happens because there's submission. We must be willing to submit ourselves into his power and trust him to make that change. Well, notice something else here. This serum was in effect and the change had occurred. And by the way, let me just say this. You say, well, you said change is from within. Yeah. You read 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter 3 should be added to John chapter 2, in my opinion. Now, I'm not improving on the wording. I'm just saying to apply it to marriage, I think it should be added. Why? Because in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, it talks about change from within. What kind of change, Pastor? The hidden man of the heart, of the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. That's what he says. You say, well, that applies to wife. No, it doesn't. It applies to the husbands as well. Because Peter, Peter goes on by saying, like the Apostle Paul, he says, and likewise, ye husbands. In other words, everything he said in the first six verses, that not only applies to the wife, that applies to the husband. Likewise, you the hidden man of the heart. That's what the Bible tells us. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We can't trust our heart. You know, if our heart is filled with ugliness, ugliness comes out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. But when our heart is filled with joy and rejoicing, you know what Jesus did? He took something that was ordinary and he made it something that's extraordinary. You want your marriage to change? Let Jesus change it. You want Jesus to change your life? Let Jesus change it. You want to get saved today? you got to get Jesus in your life. Listen, the water in itself could not change anything. The water had to be touched by the man who made the water. And the man who made the water was the Son of God. And I want to tell you this morning, God is more than just a creator. God is your Savior. God is the one who sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins. And so we see, this, we see this serum, but notice very quickly we see the satisfaction. The ruler of feast took it, and he said this. He made this statement. He, he, you, know, you can imagine, he drank of it, and he said, wow. He says, you know, every man at the beginning of a feast, he says, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. Now, they put their best foot forward at the beginning. And as the wedding goes on, as the marriage feast goes on, he said in verse 10, he says, and when men have well drunk, when they've consumed it, then they put the worst at the end. 
That sounds like our lives, amen? You start off your marriage well. You start it off with a twinkle in your eyes and enthusiasm, excitement, and joy. But as things get along, go along, you get used to this, and you forget about this. We get used to doing things a simple way, in an ordinary way. And instead of doing our best, we give our minimum. Instead of having a servant's heart, we expect to be served. And instead of us being empty, available vessels, we expect someone else to be an empty, available vessel. And I'm not picking anybody, and I'm not trying to say you're bad, and I'm not want, I don't want anybody leaving today feeling like they're, they're put down. That's not the goal. The encouragement today is realizing that we need help, and the only help we're going to get is going to come from the Lord himself. We need Jesus in our marriages, and we need Jesus in our lives, and we need Jesus in our career, and we need Jesus in everything we do. Because you know what? At some point in time, Time, you're going to hit some stressful moment, and that stressful moment is going to be so stressful, you're not sure what to do. And you know what you need to do at that moment? You need to realize you need Jesus at that moment. And so this man tasted it. He says, wow. He didn't realize water had gone in the container, but what he was drinking was freshly squeezed tantalizing grape juice. And he made this statement. Look at verse 11. Excuse me, verse 10. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. A satisfying marriage means we give our best now. Don't look at the past and say, look at everything we did wrong. Look at today and say, look at everything we could do right. Amen? And let me just say this. I'm thankful in this passage that someone didn't blurt out to everybody at the marriage feast, we have this problem. Make sure you keep your problems to yourself and to the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't broadcast to everybody. It just makes your situation worse. They brought it to Jesus, and Jesus turned a disaster into a wonderful event. And he said, you have kept the good wine until now. I read this. This is so, so good. It says, it says, and it kind of fits with our first love Sunday. Someone wrote this, being someone's first love may be great, but to be their last is beyond perfect. That's a great thought. To be someone's first love may be great, but to be their last may be perfect. It's kind of like the thought, all is well that ends well. But there's one more thought. A situation that could have blown up in a disaster was fixed by the Lord Jesus Christ. He turned this into this. And the testimony of it was, thou hast kept the good wine until now. Notice verse 11. We've seen a celebration. We've seen the stress. We've seen the submission. We've seen the serum. We've seen the satisfaction. Would you notice verse 11? We see the salvation. The Bible says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. First, Jesus is still doing miracles. He's still doing miracles in our life. But I want to tell you about how God works a miracle. Number one in verse 11, God works miracles when he gets the glory. If you want a miracle for your own personal Benefit, and you don't want him to get the glory, it's not going to happen. It just won't happen. He has to get the glory. But secondly, notice he says, and his disciples believed on him. Listen, miracles happen when there's faith and belief in God. Now, we're talking about the miracle of water that was turned to wine. And by the way, we don't read about this happening any other time. We don't read about this happening any other time. It's just one time he turned water into wine to avert a disaster. But there's a miracle that the Lord does every day. And there's a miracle that God can do in your heart today that is so important. And that is the miracle I alluded to earlier, when God can take someone who's not saved and make you saved. God can take someone who's not a child of God and make you a child of God. I'm so, so thankful that our prayer groups have just have been such a blessing. And, our, and, and many of our, 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 our church is involved. And if you're not part of a prayer group, I hope you'll join one and let us know how we can get you. And we hope we can work your schedules out. But we, we have a, a ladies group that, as we were putting them together, that uh, some of our ladies felt a little more comfortable having their prayer time in Tagalog. We have some in Spanish and some in Mandarin Chinese, and we have, uh, we have uh, uh, one in Tagalog. And, and I said, that'd be great. Let's get the ladies together in Tagalog. I think it'd be great. And one of our ladies is leading it, and they've just had a wonderful time. I get, I get updates daily on all this. But it was a blessing last night as I was kind of studying over my notes last night uh, for today uh, for this morning's message, tonight's message, and I was trying to work on a God morning devotion to be posted later this week, I got a message from the prayer group leader, and they said, Pastor, I've got some good news to share with you. We have a lady that's been watching our services for about two months. She's been watching for the Philippines. And, of course, you know, in the Philippines, it's about a 15, 16-hour difference. They're 15, 16 hours ahead of us. So right now would be their evening. Uh, this is our morning right now. 
And so she conscientiously watches our morning services, evening services, even giving us some sleep there. She's right there with our services. And when we announced the prayer groups as part of our theme of Come Boldly, she, she sent a message to us, and she said, I'd like to join a prayer group. And so we got into this prayer group, and we thought, let's get into the prayer group where the ladies are, are praying in Tagalog because we think that will be helpful for her. And we have several new believers in that we thought would be helpful. And last night, the prayer group leader texted me. She said, Pastor, I want to tell you some good news. And she gave me the lady's name, and she said, she could be watching right now. She said, Pastor, I just want you to know, this lady, she gave me her name. She said she received the Lord Jesus Christ as her Savior tonight. You know what happened to her? This became this. God changed a sinner into someone who was saved. You see, when we're not saved, we're children of the devil. And we're children of darkness. And we're children under wrath. But when you get saved, you know what happens? You become a child of God. And you become a child of light. And your child is forgiven. And your child no longer under the damnation of God. You're it's free. Listen, the greatest change in our life is knowing that we are God saved, that we are saved, that we're born again, and Jesus Christ is our Savior. Knowing that you are a born again Christian, that's the greatest change you can have. And that's a miracle because you and I cannot produce it in ourselves. It's a miracle of God. He's performing that miracle every day. He's saving people every day. Last week, a young man came to our service, he was in this service, he sat in the back at the invitation time. As I invited people to come to Christ, as I do every Sunday, that young man looked up at me and called on the Lord to save him. And Brother Walter here at the side, I asked Brother Walter, I said, Brother Walter, you take this young man aside, and make sure you can talk to him, make sure he knows he's saved. And, it, and I was one of the last ones to leave last Sunday morning, but as I was leaving, Brother, Brother Walter just gave me a thumbs up, said, Brian, I trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. And maybe today, maybe today, the greatest miracle in your life would be you accepting Jesus Christ today as your Savior calling upon him by faith and saying, dear God, I know today that I'm a sinner who needs to be saved. Would you let him save you today? Would you repent of your sins and call on the Lord to take away your sins? And on this, this day, which you will remember, Valentine's Day, February 14th, would you call on the Lord Jesus Christ to save you? Would you be born in the family of God? I mean, we look at a disaster, and I'll tell you this morning, a disaster spiritually is going through this life, dying, and not going to heaven. That would be a major disaster is spending all eternity in hell because we forsook and neglected the opportunity of accepting Christ. God loves you on this First Love Sunday. He loves you very much. And he invites you today to receive him as his Savior. Jesus came to that marriage. You know, he came with a heart of love. He came with a heart to serve. He came with a heart to help. He knew in advance that there was stress there. He knew in advance all that. But you know what he came there? He changed something that needed to be changed. And today, Jesus can change you. He can change you into a child of God. Would you accept the invitation today? Would you accept the invitation to get Jesus into your life, to save you, to wash away your sins, to make you a child of God, and to know that today you're born again to God's family, to know that that burden you carry is off your shoulders. You don't have to carry the stress of being a sinner. You can now have the enjoyment and the peace of God of knowing that you're a child of God. Let's bow our